This is a Shares for Beginners quick tip. Essential lessons, questions answered. Steve Symington is an investor, writer and analyst at The Motley Fool. The episode this snippet was taken from was recorded in May 22, so a couple of references are slightly out of date, but the general principles remain the same. We talked about Markel Corporation, a US diversified insurance and financial company known as a mini Berkshire that is blessed by bountiful accounting principles. We began by talking about some numbers around stock market declines to help you to hold your nerve when Mr. Market starts getting depressed. The hardest part of investing is psychological. And it's kind of keeping your wits about you when things seemingly go crazy. And uh, there's a, a tweet that I, I tweeted back in the March 2020 crash first, I think. And and uh, I retweeted every once in a while when the markets are going crazy to hopefully encourage people. And and uh, it, it's something that, that I try and remind you that it goes something like the stock market declines by 10% around once a year. And by the stock market, I'm talking about the broadly followed indexes. So NASDAQ, S&P 500, Dow, on average, they fall about 10% from their peak once per year, 20% every five years or so, 30% once per decade, and 50% a few times a century. So arguably faster maybe now, given the pace that uh, the markets tend to move. It's been harrowing to watch some of these really, really steep declines uh, as we change. But we also had some unprecedented quantitative easing and a lot of money pumped into the system and they're kind of scaling back asset purchases and raising interest rates to try and slow the economy down now a little bit and things are too hot and uh, there's a lot a lot of dynamics and a lot of um, a lot of good lessons I think that we're learning in the process but maybe most key is just keeping your wits about you while all this craziness goes on and not panic selling at the bottom that's I think really really key is focusing on the long term adding money continuously to your portfolio as you can you know whenever your capital allows just add that money and uh, buy businesses that you think are reasonably valued with good long-term prospects and uh, you know that's the key and over time the rest kind of tends to work itself out but uh, you really do have to shrug off however much it hurts times like this when the markets are seemingly going crazy we're going to talk about a couple of companies um, and the first one we're going to talk about and this is the complete opposite of your high growth tech stock. And it's been around for nearly a hundred years, I believe. And it's Mark Hill. This is a stock, one of the oldest stocks in my personal portfolio, both the company itself and how long I've owned it. I think I bought my first shares in the 2009 crash, actually. And I've been kind of steadily adding to it. It's a good cornerstone stock. People call it a mini Berkshire. Berkshire Hathaway, of course, is the company that Warren Buffett has kind of built over the past several decades. And Markel is kind of similar, very similar uh, in that it has a a three-tiered sort of engine that it uses to compound its book value growth, per share book value over years and years and years. So those three tiers are, uh, of course, its insurance business. It has a number of very large insurance and reinsurance businesses. It has an investment arm, just like Berkshire Hathaway. Again, they invest in publicly traded securities and fixed income investments as well. So uh, you can keep track of their portfolio. And it has a diversified group of other businesses. It calls Markel Ventures. And these are usually non-investing, non-insurance businesses that it's acquired you know, over the past couple of decades. And uh, they're very, very predictable, profitable, steadily growing businesses. And often they leave management in place. They say, we acquire businesses to basically keep them forever. So we're talking kind of boring companies like bakery equipment and, uh, you know, elevator interiors and car carriers, like the trailers you see on back of semis that have, that carry cars, uh, ornamental plants and a a leather handbag company and, and a bunch of different businesses like that, that are, you know, very, very steady, Uh, a little bit boring, but that also means it's held up really, really well in all this craziness. So, um, you know, Markel is kind of one of those cornerstone stocks in my portfolio for a reason. You know, you need to kind of balance out. You don't want to go all in on GameStop, for example, like go super high growth, you know, super high risk, high potential reward, obviously, in some cases, not necessarily GameStop, but, you know, kind of balance it out. And Markel is kind of that for me personally. And it's growth through good accounting, isn't it? It's all about the accountants and uh, the way that they read the numbers at Mark Hill, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, actually, uh, Tom Gaynor, the co-CEO, Richie Witt is the other co-CEO with him. But Tom Gaynor is this sort of 
quasi famous value investor and he was actually a CPA before. So yes, <laughs> as far as accounting, it's led by an accountant. So he understands all too well how this works. And and yeah, it's held up, you know, really, really well, you know, as the markets have crashed. I think it's it's down maybe 10% from its highs just last month, but uh, you know, it's still up a modest 10% so far this year as the markets are kind of crashing. And, and that's kind of how it goes. You know, it actually almost does better when the wind is in its face. And, uh, you know, you look back at its per share growth and book value, I think it's been like 10% over the past five years or nine or 10%, just nice and steady. Uh, you sleep well owning a business like this. And, uh, you know, you look at all, all the uh, three arms of its business, they're super healthy, you know, combined ratios at the insurance were 89 percent which you know means basically for every every dollar in premium they wrote they made eleven dollars anything under a hundred percent is a profit for insurance businesses uh, I think Markel Ventures saw revenue climb 35 percent year over year again nice steady businesses the float that's what they call it isn't it the float yep exactly and uh, yeah for the investment portfolio you know they can take a lot of the float for their insurance float and uh, it's that money that you're holding on to that you don't necessarily need to pay out, but you are holding on to it for the long term so they can invest it. It's uh, I think Warren Buffett, I forget the term he used, but he, at the time, it was a couple of years ago, he had like $80 billion that he could basically invest for free at no cost. It's like borrowing $80 billion. You can invest in, in relatively conservative stocks. And uh, Markel does something similar like that. I, I think I was looking just before we came in because I was like, what? The one sort of like... Eyesore in their most recent report was actually a uh, uh, net investment losses for the quarter. I think they took they took a net investment loss of I can't remember what it was. It was like five hundred million dollars. It fell or something year over year, but that was just because of the unrealized losses in the value of their equity portfolio. So as stocks fall, there's these funky rules for gap accounting. Gap is generally accepted accounting principles for anyone who doesn't know that. But funky rules for companies that invest in equity securities, stocks, uh, where they actually have to report the value of their equity securities on a quarterly basis. So if the value of those stocks goes down, even if they haven't sold, they have to recognize it as a, a loss on their income statement, which is just wacky, kind of weird accounting stuff. So it looks like a loss, but it's not. And actually, when you look at uh, Markel's equity securities line, it's kind of funny. Under their balance sheet, you can look at their equity securities and the value at the end of the quarter was $8.655 billion. So a little under $8.7 billion. And you can see their cost basis for those $8.7 billion in equity securities is about just under 2.9 billion. Not bad. So unrealized gains, right? So until they sell, they don't have to pay taxes on that. And uh, that's kind of the beauty is it's almost almost like a Roth IRA, right? And that's just, I guess, the beauty of investing in general. You don't pay taxes until you sell. But if the value of your $8.7 billion equity portfolio goes down by half a billion dollars in a quarter, who cares if they haven't sold it in their great businesses they want to hold forever? So incidentally, you can also look at their 13F filings, which is basically a filing where you can see all the stocks that they hold, uh, as long as their value of an equity portfolio is above 100 million. So there's a couple of companies I follow where I want them to file a 13F, but they still their portfolios are less than 100 million. So I'm like bothered because I want to see what they own. But the biggest stock in Markel's equity portfolio is actually Berkshire Hathaway. And uh, <laughs> we all know, you know, Berkshire is is just churning along. And uh, it's kind of funny because you see all these charts, you know, comparing Berkshire to ARK, you know, for example, the most famous ARK ETF and uh, Berkshire's outperformed, you know, since inception at this point. But uh, you know, a lot of people a couple of years ago were talking about how badly Berkshire was getting crushed by all the growth investors. And I don't know, slow and steady, right? The tortoise analogy is, is what, what comes into play here. So yeah, look at Markel's equity portfolio, Berkshire, Google, Amazon, Deer, Home Depot, Diageo, Disney, bunch of big stalwarts they kind of use to ride the market higher and sometimes lower, like in this quarter where you have a lot of the big tech stocks and indexes falling up and down. That's how investing goes, right? Phil Muscatello and FinPods are authorized reps of Money Sherpa. The information in this podcast is general in nature and doesn't take into account your personal situation. 